The two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. No cap for real. I put a bit of a modern twist on this quote so that I own it. The point is, the sooner you find what you love, what your unique gifts are, and what you're made for on this planet, your purpose, you might call it, the better. The main topic of this podcast is for you if you're currently not enjoying what you're doing for a living and you want to find something you'd love. Maybe you already found it, but you want to find your unique superpowers to maximize your potential and output, or you just struggle to get to work because of a lack of motivation, because it's just not enough juice and there's a, a higher calling or a purpose missing behind it all. Personally, it took me years of research, deep reflection, and just trying things out to figure this out for myself. And looking back at how fast life flies by, you don't want to waste another year doing something that is meh. Because one of the top five regrets of the dying is I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Three years ago, I uploaded a video called Why You Can't Find Your Passion. A million people saw it and the feedback was astonishing where people said it finally clicked for them. And this is the expanded version on that. And even if you already have a business or career or job that you love, finding your superpower alone and honing that, getting clearer on that is a game changer because it puts everything else you do on steroids. It'll make sense when you watch the episode. So put on your seatbelts. Let's get into it. I think for me, the pivotal point was when I sold my previous business and I really hated that business. I went through a bit of an identity crisis for a whole year because I was sitting on this cash. I wanted to start something new immediately, but anything I tried, I didn't enjoy. I was just like, this, this sucks. I'm not motivated to do anything and I'm not good at it, but I know that what I did previously, I didn't enjoy. So what should I do? And it got to the point where I remember listening to Gary Vee. Uh, you can think about Gary Vee, whatever you want. I think he, he's, he makes some great points uh, as much as, you know, people experiencing him as rambling and just repeating the th same things over and over again. But he talks about born entrepreneurs and want to be entrepreneurs. Right? And I think this may upset some people, but I think there are born entrepreneurs, meaning those are people who just love the game of business for the sake of business. They could start any business, whether it's an agency, whether it's a tech business, whether it's whatever, but they just love the building of it. Right. And I think these are people that usually tell you, oh, like, don't follow your passion, just start a business. And well, business is your passion. Personally, I could not build a business that where I'm, I'm, I don't feel passionate about the topic. So I got to a point where I was like, am I actually an entrepreneur? And I questioned myself. And that was the identity that I had built up over the year and a half that I built that business and then ended up selling it. And it felt like I was going insane because what should I do then? And um, that's when I went into this whole period of diving into, okay, who am I? How do I find what I'm here for on this planet, what I'm really good at, and then finding my path in life. And I can confidently say I found the thing and it's been one of the best things I've ever done. Just going through that period. And it was tough. But for anyone right now who's listening to this, who's in that period, who's in an identity crisis, maybe a quarter life crisis. I think a lot of people in their 20s go through it. Maybe you just also quit a certain business or a certain industry and you want to get into a new one, you're exactly where you need to be. And if you have an identity crisis right now and you're not sure what to do and you don't know sure what to believe about yourself anymore, that means change is coming. Something good is about to happen. I think what's holding people back from finding their thing, their passion, their unique skills, is usually some misconceptions that they have that make it really hard to, to find it. I think a lot of people say that in your 20s, that's the time to figure out what you want to do in life. You just try a bunch of stuff. You just graduated college or like me, you just didn't go to college and you just went straight into whatever. And you try a bunch of stuff and you figure out, okay, I enjoyed this. I didn't enjoy that. And you hop around, you shop around. And then your 30s are to do the thing that ideally you found by then. And then you get really good at it. But by the in your 40s, you make a contribution to that field. And then maybe in your 60s and later in life, you you give back to humanity, to the people who come next. 
And I think that's true. I think the 20s are there to try things out. And I think a common misconception is that once you find that thing that you're done, like once you find your passion, it's like this one thing. And then I'm like, okay, I've made it. This is it. What I found is that it moves in cycles. And yes, I did find a thing that I knew I was going to focus on for the next decades, which is yapping online and hearing myself talk because I like that. <laughs> um, and at the same time, every four or five years, I think you hit a point where you're like, what's next? Because there's some shift coming. And Tim Ferriss actually talked about this. I remember going through this phase where I was researching and studying and reflecting. And Tim Ferriss said that every four to six years, he has a period where he's like, what now? What do I want to do? What's next? And he has to refine his next path, right? Uh, there's actually a great video by this channel called actualize.org. Um, and the, the, the video is called Life Unfolds in Chapters and Phases. It's a beautiful video uh, where he breaks down that, yeah, our, our life just moves in these different chapters that are basically four chapters. The first one is limbo. That's when you're unsure, you're developing a compelling vision. Maybe that's after high school, after college, or you know, right before you start your business. You're just like, I, I want to do something. I don't know what, I'm unsure. The second one, the second phase is you're starting, which is when you engage in what you want to do and you start building momentum, which is actually where we're at right now. We're just starting the podcast. Um, number three is the middle. This is the peak actualized success. This is when things are going really well. Uh, you're hitting a stride, you're doubling down on mastery, and that's where you really start seeing the, the rewards. And number four is the end, when you're just finishing up, you're letting go, and there's depletion. There's almost a satiation where you're like, oh, I don't want to keep doing this. Yes, it's paying well. Yes, it's going well. And you go back into the first phase, which is limbo, where you start developing a compelling vision again. So I just went through this journey again with content, because, and it was pretty much exactly four years. I... Yeah, after selling my business, took me a while. Then I found YouTube after a bunch of trials and errors, which I want to cover later on on how I actually did that because there is a process. Um, and then I set a compelling vision by saying, hey, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. I'm going to do this. And then over the last four years, I did that, had some success. And I hit an end with the previous videos, with the high production videos where I was like, I can't keep doing this. And the compelling vision, now phase one, the limbo, was I think I'm going to do a podcast and now in stage two. So that's, I think, the first misconception is that this journey keeps going. You keep, and I think you keep narrowing down what you actually like, what your thing is. And every few years, as you're making changes, as you're making adjustments, you get closer to the thing that you want to do. Like I got a haircut yesterday and I talked to my barber about it and he was in cybersecurity. Then he became a barber. And while he was in cybersecurity, he just knew, I do enjoy this because he was facing clients, right? He was interaction with, interacting with clients. He was in sales. He was making sure the, the uh, clients were having success. And he liked that part of it, but he was missing something. He was missing a creative, crafty element. And then he ended that chapter and became a barber, which is also, again, customer facing. He's interacting with clients. But there's this creativity element added to it. And that's something that I've noticed too, is that you just keep narrowing it down. You keep getting closer to the thing you actually want to do. So for example, there was so much video editing involved in previous videos where I'm like, that's not my thing. That's not the thing that I want to do. And so podcasting allows us to just keep it running and delete that side of it, right? And do more of the things that give the most energy that are the most energy rich and the most exciting uh, and, and minimize the things that were the most draining, which is what editing was. What chapter are you in right now? I was going to flip it back to stage four. So the fourth one, and there seems to be like maybe each stage takes a year or so. Let's just, that's, that's just what I'm hearing. And let's say you get to, to stage four and there's a gap between stage four and going back to stage one that, that you started to, to put into my head. When you were figuring out, okay, I have this business, 
you didn't know it was going to be content creation. You didn't know it was going to be YouTube. You said you did a lot, a lot of trial and error. I was curious, like what that gap is like, is like a in between, it's like a bridge to loop back. Like, what does that look like? I think it's seamless to be honest, four and one. Because I think as you are getting satiated with the previous thing, you start dreaming about, ah, oh, if only, you know, if only I didn't have to do so much editing. If only there was a creative element to this whole part. Because he was a musician, my barber. He was a musician before, got into cybersecurity. And then he wanted to take a piece of the music chapter in his life into the next chapter, right? And so... I think it's a seamless transition. They are they are overlapping, where you're like, oh, if only I don't like. I mean, it's good, but I just feel like I want to interact with people more. I feel like I want to get more out there. I want to spend less time in front of the computer screen and edit and and just more, like, be able to express more. And it starts brewing over time, and I think people just know, like, you can just tell what's currently missing in what you're currently doing. And then the next phase is, I, I think sometimes just finding a way to add that in so that you meet that need as well, uh, which is, yeah, it's a luxury. We, we're so lucky we live in the 21st century. We can, we can do so much stuff. The next misconception that I see is very common is that if you love what you do, you don't have to work a single day in your life. It's like this whole, ah, uh, I'm on vacation every single day because I love my occupation. It's, it's not that. Because I think the thinking behind it is that if you really loved it, you wouldn't need discipline. Because I remember while I was trying to figure out my next thing was that I started certain projects and I needed discipline. I needed some motivation. It wasn't that exciting. There were certain parts of it where I was like, oh, this is annoying. This is probably not my passion. Because if it was my passion, I, I wouldn't have to push myself, right? But I think there will always be work and procrastination involved. Like think about any writer, like, you know, you probably heard of the the War of Art from Stephen Pressfield, where he talks about resistance and how every writer every day faces resistance. With that thinking, everyone who's born to be a writer, who has a skill and a natural talent there and actually loves writing, with that belief, with that misconception, they would think, oh, it's not my passion because I have to push myself to sit down and write. It's a funny, funny quote that uh, Ryan Holiday said is, uh, nobody wants to write, everyone wants to have written. <laughs> and yeah, it kind of... Uh, burst that little fantasy bubble that I think is holding people back from digging into things that, you know, are difficult, but they actually are worth pursuing. So I think Mark Manson talked about this too, choosing what you're willing to tolerate. So I think in the beginning, especially when starting out with something that you may be passionate about, for example, let's say YouTube, there's so much stuff involved that's going to suck. If you like yapping like us and just like, oh, let me share my thoughts. I love smelling my own farts and hear myself talk. That's literally 5% of it. But is that 5% worth it? So you, you can go through the 95% of things that you don't really like that much, which is editing, booking guests, all of that, right? I love surfing. I hate paddling against the waves to get out there in the first place to catch a wave. I hate that. It's so exhausting. Sometimes I think it's not worth it. I'm like, Put a put a fucking engine on this thing on this thing, and so I don't I don't surf because of that, but I, I know that I would love it. So either way, whether you find your thing or not, it's not always going to be great. It's not going to feel like a vacation. It's not going to be effortless. In fact, you still need discipline and you still need to push yourself at times. I think the goal as well is that over time you increase the percentage of things you enjoy and you decrease the percentage of things you don't enjoy that involve that, right? So, you know, right now I may do the editing of the podcast. I don't want to do that. We'll be delegating that. Um, same thing with other things, right? So next misconception that I think are holding so many people back is that passions need to be productive. They need to make money. And so many people stop themselves in their tracks because they're like, oh, I can't, I can't make money with that. I can't make money with jerking off. Meanwhile, I keep getting ads for sperm donors. I posted about this on Instagram. I just keep getting ads. Oh, like like it really funny memes that are like finishing solo versus finishing in a cup for $1,400 a month. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
you know that uh, I don't know if you know this. I I, I recently uh, found out how, how how the algorithms work. They like uh, recommend things that we're already clicking on. I don't know something something for you to look into. Maybe I did fill out a form, but that's as far as I got. Anyways, jokes aside, so many people they're into video games. They're into I don't know listening to podcasts. Maybe maybe anyone here listening. I don't know. Or they're into comic books. And they just think, oh, that doesn't count because that, that's that doesn't make money. Meanwhile, people are making money with that. And it's usually a field that encompasses so many opportunities. Like if you love sports, it's not the only way to be an athlete that you can be involved in sports. There are hundreds of different jobs. It could be in media. There's dozens of sub jobs in there. Could be in management. Could be in construction, constructing the stadium. Could be in event coordination. Could be in so many things, right? And so, people just cut themselves short. But they're like, "Oh, that's not really that's not really a real thing." Um, and again, bringing it back, the sauce from Mark Manson. I think he has some really good thoughts on this topic. It's right there in front of you. You're just avoiding it for whatever reason. You're avoiding it. You're telling yourself, "Oh well, I love comic books, but that doesn't count. You can't make money with comic books." No. Let it sit. And I think at the root of this is a problem that I want to touch on later. But first, let's get the misconceptions out of the way so we can clear our minds of those. Then talk about what's actually at the root of the problem and then how to actually do it. What's the actual how-to on how you can get more clarity on your passion, your superpowers, and um, what makes you a good utility to the society because that's what life is all about. Being useful. Being useful. <laughs> Next misconception, passions are something tangible and they're obvious things. Like I think people think way too surface level, like painting, singing, building a business, or, or they think in terms of topics like, oh, I like sports, I like cars, I like marketing. Uh, what I touched on in the video is that it's usually something much deeper beneath the surface, right? It's not just that you like selling, you like communicating different perspectives or persuading someone of a different psychology. It could be, even, yeah, even with psychology, like what about psychology? It's understanding how humans work. That's a deeper thing. That's a layer deeper, right? And so while you might think you like comic books, you may actually like the storytelling that empowers people to see a strength that they didn't see before. There's so many ways to do that. Like my barber, for example, he told me, I was like, what do you love about, like I was doing research for this part. I was like, what do you love about being a barber? And he's like, Man, it's just, I know how good I feel when I get a good haircut. And I just love making p people feel that way. So what do you think, how many ways can you do that? It's not just by cutting someone's hair. It's also by, like, he could, he could work with kids who are disabled and make their day. Or he could, anything that develops that feeling in people, right? And so same thing with, oh, okay, I like eating. I like restaurants. Maybe you don't like just eating at restaurants. Maybe you like the attention to, de to detail that makes the simple things in life extraordinary, right? Or you love bringing people together because you have dinner with friends. And maybe you don't like just watching documentaries because, oh, I like documentaries, it's my passion. But you like communicating ideas that expand people's minds. And there are so many ways to do that, right? And so going deeper, not just surface level. And... Um, yeah, and I think it's also good to distinguish between three types of components when it comes to finding your path or your passion, whatever you want to call it. We're using so many terms. It doesn't matter. Three components. Number one, there's a topic. A lot of people think about just that in terms of passion. So what are you passionate about? Oh, I'm pa passionate about golf, about cars, music, basketball, data, whatever. I think that's one way to look at it. Like, okay, I like going to the gym. Okay, then maybe start a... a a clothing brand for gyms or become a personal trainer or maybe like there's so many things you can do that's where i think the next thing comes in which is the next component which is activities because each topic requires certain activities or tasks that you do types of tasks and that's basically what you do day to day could be writing could be networking brainstorming spreading some sheets in excel you know whatever like people are different the question there is just like what comes naturally to you and we'll dive deeper into that and how to figure that out. But there's just some activities to me, I don't want to do them. Like planning my birthday 
again, I'm sorry for everyone who attended that. I'm not good with logistics. Sick invite, bro. You should be glad you weren't invited. It was a Dude. shit show. Don't let me organize things. Don't let me figure out logistics. You know what? This is uh, a, a question that's coming up is how do you know? Like, let's say I, I start writing. Someone says, write. Okay, I'm going to start. And then how do you know that it's I you, you don't like it or you just don't want to get through that initial phase of, oh, this is uncomfortable? Like, where's the distinction? That's the tough part, right? That's the whole idea of how do you know if you just if you just don't like it or if you just need some discipline, right? Which the misconception we talked about before. I think I think you got to do it a few times. And then when you're not doing it, are you like, oh, I kind of want to do that again. Uh, Noah Kagan has the rule of 100 where just it's more for business, but just, you know, do it 100 times first. Maybe something like that applied to this would, would just like, because the first five times you're probably not going to be that good even if it's a hobby. And maybe if you take down the pressure of, oh, this is just for fun, I'm not monetizing it, like you said earlier, takes that pressure away completely. And then in the in the future, you could say, yep, okay, I, I definitely don't like that. I think doing a certain amount of volume of it, and I think the best gauge for that, and that's something I wanted to touch on later as well, but might as well share it now, is when you're doing an activity, after you've done the activity, did it give you energy? Like, do you feel more energized after it? Or do you feel drained? Or maybe it's neutral. There's certain things that I do. I'm like, oh, I can do them and I don't feel drained. I don't feel energized. I know that when I hop on calls with the community, for example, I love it. After it, I'm like, like I'm, I'm pumped up. You hate it. Oh, you love it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll forget what you told me yesterday. Never mind. Oh, yeah. I was talking shit about people again, right? We both do. We both. We both. They're called YouTube subs for a reason, right? F followers, subhumans. No. Anyways, let's just move on. There are certain activities that give me energy, and there's certain activities where, man, when I had to set up a funnel and click funnels, or when I go into Photoshop, like, <laughs> if you like seeing me pissed off and losing my temper, like, give me, give me a few minutes. Give you, I'm give you like, a, a juicy funnel. Dude, why isn't this working? I wanted to do this. I don't want to figure it out. Can, can somebody please just do it for me? And I get drained. It's like, if I did that first thing in the morning, I, I would just uh, instantly be drained. All my willpower is just gone. That's so, it. So first thing in the morning when you're using those, there's, a, the, there's the, the maker time and the manager time. Maker time being your most creative hours, manager being just the nonsense. The Let's say you're working in a corporation, you're interviewing people you're on meetings it's not very creative work that's uh that could be a great gauge what you just said about okay if i don't want to do this during maker time during my peak brain power i probably should avoid it maybe yeah i think that definitely applies to some activities i think other ones like networking people who love networking and that's their whole thing like you you just need to be in front of people you just need to be talking to people constantly. You just need to be going to parties and events and conferences and connect with people because that's your unique ability. And the more time you spend there, the more money you'll make, the more fulfilled you'll be, and the more productive you'll be. And those are usually in the afternoons, right? Um, so I think it depends on the activity, but I think that's, that is a good gauge for these brain-heavy activities. So the first two components, just want to finish that up. The first one is topic. Think about passions in that way. Okay, what is a topic that I like? Secondly, activities. What activity do I like? Is it selling? Is it is it managing people? Is it working with people? Is it networking? Is it is it just just give me like let me just write code? That'll give you much closer to an ideal path and what you can do. And then the third one is purpose. So some sort of bigger reason why you do it. Like my Baba said, who who said, I just want to make people feel great. And they want, they want, yeah, they I want them to feel like 50 bucks, like in my case, it's how much I paid. Or a million bucks, right? It, it looks great. Thank you. Um, but that that's usually the deeper stuff, right? The, the purpose, the higher calling, whatever. I think some people, they get really cheesy with it. Some people get really broad with it. It's like, I just want to help people. It doesn't really, yeah. I mean, if who it, doesn't? If it, if it tickles your pickle, like go with that. 
I think oh. the purpose of that is just something that excites you, right? And so it could be expanding people's minds, empowering others, uniting people. But I think it usually involves something bigger than just yourself. Like you can't just be like, ah, oh, I just want to make a lot of money so that I'm rich. Um, that's what I tend to see. And at the same time, that can be a big motivator too. So really just pick whatever, pick whatever is good for you. Um, and so, I mean, I've heard people before who said, um, my purpose in life is to experience or receive and give love. And that's just, that's just beautiful, man. It just made me, yeah, that just, uh, was, it was just like a mic drop. It was, it was beautiful. And I think, yeah, that's something that you can remind yourself of to get out there and do things that are challenging. So these are some of the misconceptions. Do you think there's anything else that you have? Otherwise, we can just get to the core of the problem that, that I see that causes people to get out of touch with their passion. I do have a story. Maybe six years ago, I was recruiting for, what was it? It was a company called Consensus. And a lot of fun. It's like a crypto company. Uh, lots of hype. Um, and I go to an after party event in Brooklyn and there's this famous pizzeria in the area called Roberta's Pizza. Highly recommend anyone that goes to Brooklyn to check it out. It's really good. I'm talking to this Australian guy and he's asking me, so what do you do? And I'm, I'm with him and his friends, just random. I don't know these people. And I'm like, so proud that I'm recruiting and I'm making six figures and you know, the six figure rule. If you're saying, <laughs> if you tell people you make six figures, you, you know, that's a big range, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> it could be a hundred and one thousand. <laughs> you are making six figures, but, you know, so I'm like, I made six figures and I'm changing What's the I'm six figure rule. Six figure rule is um, typically people who make under a certain threshold in six figures will say they make six figures. So if I, uh, or anything above maybe like 250K, you'll just, they'll just say, yeah, I make multiple six figures or I just make 300K, I make 900 like, They'll just tell you. <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I've seen that in myself. Like this is from experience. I don't want to tell you that. It's a six-figure principle. It's a six-figure principle. <laughs> exactly. It's the same thing with business, right? When, if somebody tells you I have a seven-figure business, you know how much they're making. They're making $1 million in revenue. Uh, not two million because if they made two million they would have said i make multiple seven figures they'd be so proud to tell you how many multiple of that thing they make so i i told the guy the australian guy he was so so nice he actually changed that was a big moment for me uh as it relates to how i talk about the things that i do i said i just i i recruit and i'm like word vomit I do. I, I'm, oh, I'm so fancy. Six figures. Meanwhile, we're in like Bushwick, dude. If you know anything about Brooklyn, like this isn't the, like no one gives up. Bro, do you do? It's like someone, what do you do? Someone gives you this title. Okay, but <laughs> what do you do? And then he goes, <laughs> yes, it doesn't answer the question. Right? And he goes, oh, that's cool. You know what I do? And I go, what do you do? I just skate. I just love skating. And dude, it, it was such a pattern interrupt and it was so powerful because his friends were like, yeah, what do you do? I'm like, he's like, bro, we just want to like, what are you passionate about? Like, just tell us that. I don't, we don't care. We don't, we're not asking you about this weird stuff. Like, and they, they, it was kind of embarrassing. I was like, I don't know. Do I even like this? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a it's a useful skill to know how to communicate what you are actually doing, and even knowing that yourself. Because, like, what what do you do? Um, I think sometimes people just want to hear, okay, what what category to put you in? Okay, you okay, you're in sales, cool. But then other times, like when people really want to get to know you, like when you're at a conference, there are so many entrepreneurs who you can tell that they were taught that you have to have a one line pitch. So we help mission-driven entrepreneurs to scale their impact. And it's like, okay, uh, so what do you do? Okay, so you run, you run Facebook ads. Okay, cool. 
Just fucking yeah. say that. Don't be fancy. fancy. Just yeah. So just it depends on what environment you're in, right? Um, but <laughs> that that's what I would add. That's what I would add to this uh, to the to the three uh, misconceptions that you said is like at the end of the day, we you do something like just it's and you should accept what that is. But at the time, I'm helping people land jobs, and I haven't I haven't even thought of this reverse like what is it exactly. And mm -hmm. I, I, I fall back to that story often. It's like, yeah, what, what do you do? It's such a pattern interrupt. No, no, no I, I, okay, yeah. Yeah, you make all this money. Like, how? We scale their impact by finding the highest levers below. It's like, do you, do you help yeah. women grow their booties? Is, is, is that the thing? <laughs> is, yes. That's through great, man. Training. Is it through personal training or is it through injections? <laughs> Just tell it's us. Ama that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With these misconceptions out of the way, that we clear up some way to, okay, figure out how can we reflect? Because whatever the situation you're in right now, maybe you have a business and you kind of enjoy it, but you wish you enjoyed it more. There is a way to bring out more of that fun and excitement and make a small pivot in your business like the way that I did with the content here. Um, or you're currently in an identity crisis, you hate what you do and you want to do something else. And you know what topic you're into, but you don't know what activity or career path there is, right? So I believe at the core of the problem of all of this is that there was a time when you just liked what you liked and you didn't feel shame for it or attached requirements to it. It has to be productive. It has to make money. It has to be reasonable because I believe everyone already knows what they're passionate about. Like as a child, you can't not know because it's so visceral, you just feel it. It just naturally comes out what you're good at because society or media or your peer group or your parents haven't molded you into something yet where you had to be a certain way in order to get love, in order to be accepted. And so it is about who were you then? Because you already know what you're passionate about deep inside. And what did you like? Because you just liked the things you liked. So I think a massive struggle that people have is that they're just not being themselves and they've forgotten who they are. Again, because society, media, parents made them think they should do X, Y, and Z, but they're actually ABC. Like you should be this disciplined, structured person that gets good grades, but you're actually a social butterfly and you want to be around people, right? Oh, thank you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> And then people say, I really want to be a lawyer or I really want to be an entrepreneur, but they actually don't. You don't want that. You want to want that. You wish you would want that because your parents want you to, or because some influencers online said that nine to fives are dumb and they're cringe, which is bizarre. Like that's usually the broke entrepreneurs tell you that that's selling you a course when nine to fives are amazing. If you pick the right one and one that you love, like Gosh, so amazing. I mean, you can talk a lot about that topic too because um, you've had incredible positions where you learned a ton, you made a ton of money, you love what you do and you had so much autonomy and such a big impact on the company and the mission and all that, right? And I think peer groups also box you in. I think they have a bigger impact oftentimes than our parents, which is kind of scary if you're becoming a parent. But I remember moving to the US, for example, so many people just assumed because I'm German, as soon as they heard that, that I'm German, they would assume that I'm serious and I'm super disciplined and I'm not funny, which, come on, clearly, you know? Ha <laughs> ha. I would see myself a certain way, right? I would see myself a certain way where I would be like, yeah, maybe, yeah, I guess I am that way. And I would, I would feel boxed in, right? And then I would be treated a certain way. And oftentimes I think you're treated a certain way by the people around you, whether it's your parents, your peer group. And then you start developing an identity and you act in accordance with that. And I remember for myself that I could never see myself being on YouTube because that's, that's like entertainment stuff. Like I'm an entrepreneur. I was, I built this e-commerce business and I'm really, everyone knows me as very disciplined and I'm not going to be a goofball on YouTube. It didn't even seem like an option. And here I am, right? I was just gonna add, it's important to break people's patterns of belief to what they think you already are. Oh, so when, tough. when I was leaving 
Uh, so I was recruiting early on in my career and I was like, okay, this is cool. I picked up that skill. I, I, I was good at it. I said, I really wanted to work in the building that we were working out of. And, and uh, long story short, I did, but I had an exit interview and everybody knows how dreadful these can be at uh, companies. They ask you BS questions, every, like, where are you going? And at this point, my identity is talent acquisition. And I said, oh, I'm going to run this building, the one we're sitting in right now. And she goes, you're like 24. Do you have experience in real estate? I said, no. She's like, are you leaving? It? <laughs> I said, I said, no. She's like, is, is this... <laughs> Is this because of the money? I said, no. This is my. <laughs> I said, no. I said, no. This is this is my dream job. This is going to be my dream job. I get to work with the owner. We're going to have events. Oh, so you're you're not going to recruit? It's like no. I'm just going to do this now. The shock. I, I would I would love to see that they they're taking notes that exit interview, and then some of my friends that worked at that company. Oh, you're you're uh, you're leaving recruiting. Oh, uh, they're still recruiting. And meanwhile, I've been a degenerate job hopper for the last ten years. Anyways, um, <laughs> but the pattern was is the belief systems that they had over what I do were so strong, especially when you're good at something, which I think I was decent. Is like, well, we are gonna just do something else now. What? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough because these people, they put you into a box and you're supposed to be this way and you're not supposed to be a different way because then I have to do all this work and recategorize you in my mind. And then we have these assumed social hierarchies in our mind that now get all mixed up. But yeah, I think the core challenge here is that people don't know who they are or they, they do deep down, but they're not accepting it. They're like, I want to be this way, but I'm that way. Right. And I think anytime you use the word should, I should be this way. I, I should be more disciplined. I should be an early bird. It's like a guaranteed recipe for shame and a, just a decrease in self-esteem. It's like you're looking at a menu and you're like, I would like, I would like to have one decrease in self-esteem and, and a feeling of, of shame. Oh, just use the word should because it's just saying I am this, but I should be that. You're just denying reality, right? And you will never win against reality you're always going to lose that battle and yeah, just knowing and accepting yourself first of all knowing who you are and then accepting that is just freedom because think about so many people who want to be like elon musk so badly but you're not and you never will be and you don't want to be you don't have what it takes you don't have the iq you don't have the drive you don't have the necessary childhood trauma that he had i gotta share a story about elon so I had a, an Elon phase where I would mimic the way he talks for like a year straight. And my <laughs> eye. That is uh, so cringe. It's, <laughs> I mean, it is pathetic. I started, I saw in one of his interviews that his eyes, when he would think, would go like this. So in some of my earlier, <laughs> dude, it's so, it's so my earlier YouTube videos, my wife looks at them and be like, dude, your eyes, where are they like, uh, and I'm like, cause I'm thinking, I'm thinking like, that's what, that's what people do. And no, that's what Elon does. Not you. <laughs> like, that's what he does. Don't like, what are you? <laughs> like, the, <That's> so funny. <laughs> it's pathetic. It's, but it's pathetic in a funny way. Like, because you know what I've noticed? It's adorable. I think it's adorable. There actually is an, we talked about this. There is an objective reality. Like we are talking. Yeah, I, can you debate that me and you are not having a conversation right now? Well, how deep do you want to go? I don't want to go deep. It's just like okay. surface, like we're having a conversation. And some people deny that as every, everything can be subjective. And then they take that belief. On, I, I definitely did onto themselves, like, ah, maybe, maybe you're not going to go and be an astronaut. It's okay. You're, you're not going to go to NASA. It's fine. Like maybe, like you said, you're not going to be a lawyer. I'm not going to go to the NBA. But it's true. I mean, f I think for as long as you try to be something that you're not, you're at 20% of your own capacity, 40%, 60%, whatever. 
And the older I get, I think we talked about this a lot too, the older I get, the more I realize so much of it is just who, how you're born. Oh, we could dive into this, my friends. Yeah. Well, let's do this on a, on a separate episode. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, the older I get, the more I realize I have been born a certain way. And I could, if I just maximize that way, incredible. And the more I know that I embrace that, uh, or who I truly am, the more successful and happy and fulfilled I'll be. Um, and this whole like self-help BS that you can be anything you want, no. You can, here's the thing. You can try. You can try. And most things will suck for you. Like one example I usually give is that some people, a lot of people, are just naturally introverted. They're just naturally introverted. They just like to process things internally, right? That's the definition of being introverted versus extroverted who, who they love to process things externally and they tend to be more outgoing. They tend to like to interact with people more, all of that, right? And I think you can work really, really hard as an introvert to become more extroverted, It'll take you years. It'll take you a lot of work. And you're going to become a mediocre extrovert. With a lot of work, you're going to become a mediocre extrovert. And if you just put that work into the gifts and talents that you have as an introvert, which are plenty, you'll you go so much further. You'll be so much more like a fish in water in your element. You'll get so much further. You'll get so much more productive, so much more fulfilled and happy. And just uh, life is just going to run like a well-oiled machine way more than if you try to do something that's just not for you a part of me wants to not label certain things but also that goes against the objective reality that i just talked about because <laughs> like inside of there's this like like probably so many people know reject reject the, the reject reality i could i can do anything it's it's like a it's I think there's truth to it too, by the way. There's truth to that too, by the way. When is it helpful to go against the current, right? Like, I mean, like, yes, I, I suck at this thing, but I, and, and I really want to do it. So now what? Is it an adjustment? Because that's what I'm, it, is it an adjustment where, okay, I'm not the best at sales, but sales is so, there's so many various forms of sales. Maybe I, I'd be great at selling in the DMs, which is a, a, a thing. Maybe I'm not good on a call, but I still want to talk to people. So that adjustment, I think, is 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 critical for everyone to just think to themselves about. Okay, I'm not good at this thing, but it, it's multifaceted. These topics that you just discussed, I I may not go to the NBA. Just like I told you, dude. Some of these guys post videos on YouTube. They're technically professionals as once they they're getting paid. It's just not the standard of what society said this is how you do it yeah I, I think there is truth to rejecting certain things and also not labeling yourself so there's these two things to look at one hey let's embrace who we are and then also not labeling yourself so anytime i say like even when i said uh like i cringed a little bit at that but when i said oh i'm bad at logistics i'm like uh, i shouldn't say that because i can do it and the more I say I'm bad at it, the worse I actually get at it. So I think there was even a study done with children when they, specifically with girls, I think uh, girls tend to be more on the agree agreeableness scale. They, they tend to be more agreeable. And so if you tell girls, hey, you're bad at math, but just try your best, that grades actually get worse. They actually get worse at math. Um, same thing for boys. I think it's more so for girls. I could be totally wrong. This is just off the top of my head, but um, that happens to us too, where we think, oh, I'm bad at this. And then we move in with a lack of confidence. And so it's like both sides of the coin. And I, I, I'm not subscribed to only one. I think both, right? Nuance, both are true. This brings me to a valid point that I would tell my younger self about everything that we're talking about, but just in general as a, a meta skill, like above like a 30,000 foot skill, like there are some things like this or beliefs where you need to be able to hold two opposing truths in your mind at the same time. So sometimes you do need to reject reality and accept that you may just not go to the NBA. I'm, I'm just speaking to myself here. <laughs> like, 
yeah, there's a story of uh, I think Tony Robbins was telling this story at at his live event where in his book he said, "Hey, look at reality. Like you're not going to be the dunking champion being five foot seven or five foot six. And then years later, he had to update the book. Little update: the dunking champion of year so and so is five six. <laughs> or something like that yes like somebody like there's some sort of dunking competition and this this little guy won it because he just was just jumping like a frog both are true and the tough thing is just when to when do you reject versus when do you accept and what's the answer no idea i'm just the dude on the internet yapping about stuff so we can talk about the things that we can actually do practical things to find our passions so I think the biggest thing to do here is really to go into reflection mode. Go into reflection mode and really start questioning everything and becoming very introspective. And the best tool that I found is journaling. You can do it physically with journal, writing, if you like that. You can also just go for walks and do voice notes. I think that works really well for people too. And also just having conversations with people. I think that was very helpful for me as an extrovert, as someone who likes to process things with other people. Um, And just asking yourself very specific questions, such as, what have I always been drawn to as a child? That'll also help you figure out your superpower. What am I just naturally drawn to and therefore probably also good at? I think these are usually overlaps. Like We tend to be good at the things that we like doing and we tend to like the things that we're good at. So like whenever people put these two things apart, like, oh, what if, what if I, well, what if I were to like something that I'm actually really bad at? I think that's, I think it's uncommon. What have I always been drawn to naturally as a child? What comes easy to me that doesn't come easy to everyone? This was a fascinating one for me because I had a fr- conversation with a friend and I was talking about the funnel stuff and he's like, oh yeah, like I put I was putting together this, this website and it's just like, oh, and he's like, oh, I love that stuff. Like if I, if I could just do that, I would just do that all the time. I'm like, are you okay? what's wrong with you? And what was really draining to him was recording himself and and yapping and talking. And I was like, dude, that's my thing. I thought what was easy for everyone was easy for me and vice versa, right? Like, of course it's easy to talk on camera and just talk. Like that's, that's the easiest thing. Of course it's easy to just go to an event and I have to sit down and put together a website or a funnel or some software, Photoshop, whatever. No. For other people, that is so energizing. Like some people love technical problems. Like I hate the camera stuff and like figuring out the lighting and like, oh, there's a problem. This adapter doesn't fit here. There's some psychopaths out there who actually like that. So just let them do that. And so whatever you think is great for you and comes easy to you may not come easy to other people. So it's very helpful to have conversations with other people about that. Some people love organizing stuff. They love organizing parties. They love organizing events. They love complexity and just organizing things. It's just cool. You do that. I I don't want to do that. And that's the beauty of diversity, of having human beings with different personalities, different brain chemistries. And so very helpful question that, that really helped me. Um, and, and then also, if there's only one task I could do for the rest of my life, what would it be? Can be a good indicator. And yeah, asking other people. I remember asking my sister, what do you think I'm really good at? That was when I was thinking of becoming a business broker. I was thinking, hey, I just sold my business. I I know people who are selling their business. Maybe I can broker some deals. Like, what the hell? Like, I had no idea what I liked. And so I asked my sister, like, okay, what do you think I'm good at? She's like, you're really funny. Like, you're really good at imitating people or just being goofy. And yeah, you're good at, like, talking and i was like that doesn't really help me like that's not a thing that you can do but that doesn't help me find my passion but you know now it's easy to see okay i should just film myself and and then put myself on the internet and start a youtube channel those are skills that become valuable here um like i don't think i'm i don't think i'm that funny but apparently i can keep someone engaged when i'm talking and so yeah i think the goal in this period of reflection and asking other people and talking to your friends or talking to people who who know you really well and they've known you for a long time, ideally they knew you as a child, the goal is to bring forward who you truly are at your core before society, parents, media told you who you should be. That was very insightful for me. A very, very uh, challenging period, actually, because 
I didn't know what to believe anymore. And so that's how I stumbled upon YouTube. I was like, you know what? L let me just make a funny skit where I, I made fun of like some entrepreneur stuff. Like I was making fun of like morning routines and I made a sketch. And it was the first time I did something where I was like, I actually kind of enjoyed that. Mm, felt good. I shared it with my friends online and then on Facebook and people loved it. And I was like, there's something here. But YouTube is not really a thing you can do. Like you can't really make money with that. Oh boy, was I wrong. <laughs> and that's how I then started the YouTube channel. And then, yeah, I built up a small fan base that was really niche. Like Rian Doris, for example, he says to this day, he loves, he loved those videos. And um, yeah, months later, I made some adjustments and I realized I don't want to just be a, an idiot on the internet and just make sketches. I actually want to also share some thoughts and ideas and, you know, challenges I'm going through or what I'm learning. And then I made some more serious videos. And then I started a new channel, which is the channel that I have now. And had it not been for the conversation with my sister, I don't know if I would have found it or how long it would have taken me. Have you had experiences like that where you got some feedback from someone else or somebody reflected something about you that seemed obvious to you or it seemed like not a thing, but is actually something that made you stand out? A really weird one. It's I still haven't applied it. <laughs> I asked one of my uh, best friends, like, <laughs> what do you see me doing? I, I, I went through this. It was very unhelpful because I didn't do it. Uh, he said, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I could see you being like a spy, like, like being like, like an agent in the FBI. Are you? Because I know you wouldn't be able to tell me, but one day you'll tell, he, he still thinks I one day will tell him I'm in the FBI. I just can't reveal it. So I, I don't know, like it, it's helpful. Uh, I, 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 two things came up for me while you were giving me that sauce. Thank you. I I'm, 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 ate, ate that up. <laughs> There's a, uh, this reality and everyone's giving you their opinions over what you think you should do. So there's a skill, a critical skill for you do need to trust thyself. That's in the matrix. If for anyone that's watched, that's right above the Oracle's, uh, it's in the Oracle's house in that apartment. Literally as he walks in, it says, trust thyself. You do need to eventually take in all this data, listen to what people are saying and and take action over like what feels best for you. I think that's that's what I'm I'm hearing. The second thing and very tactical, um, when I was anytime I actually struggle with figuring out, okay, what do I like? What do I don't like? Especially for people that have a job, I found this to be extremely helpful. This is actually how I first wanted to go into the uh, running the co-working business in Brooklyn from recruiting, which is like two separate things it seems like. So anyone that has a job, uh, you do certain tasks every single day. There's daily and weekly. What I would highly re suggest, recommend, is write down as you're doing them every little thing for like the next three days. So for example, with recruiting, I would say, like as silly as this is, open up my email and then I would see, okay, I would get that granular and say, okay, do I like opening up the email? It's, it's eventually you have like three to 500 things like this written out. And as you're doing them, you start to see patterns because somebody could say, I don't like, I don't like uh, surfing. And you're going to start to see, well, I actually don't like taking the board to go paddle. So how, and then you, you, you start to see all the patterns of what you like within that whole topic. And for me, it was, I liked talking to people. I liked figuring out, uh, I liked helping them with their business, their, their jobs, their careers. I didn't like all the minutiae, all the like little nuance. Um, and I applied that to my next thing. So, uh, just to summarize, you list everything you're doing and you question every single thing. Like, why don't I like this? Do I like this? And all of a sudden you have a map of 10 to 20 things within that field because most people will have something that they're doing and they'll just say, I don't like my job. You don't like certain things about your job. And over time, over my 20s, I'm almost 32, 
I've I have a map of twenty or so things from all the job hopping I've done to now say, okay, I like this and this and this. I definitely didn't like that. That would be what I would add to this first step. And I guess the the gauge again, like we said, is does it drain you or does it energize you? That that could be one thing to look at. Yes. And, yeah. And then looking looking at the twenty things out of the hundreds of things that you do. And looking, what do these things have in common? I think that would be interesting to see. Oh, whenever I interact with people, that's really energizing to me. What people? And what are you doing with these people? Are you persuading them? Are you supporting them? Are you just listening to them? Like, what is it, right? It, um, it, it feels tedious to, to go through this. But as a habit, if you just do it a few times, it, it uncovers such a different world like it, it definitely helped me. I, I, I redo this exercise from time to time. Just see, is what I believe, what I believed five years ago, is it still active today? So it's like, a, as you grow, which you said, there's different stages, which stage are you in one through four, these things will change within those stages as well. So I think first one reflecting whether it's by yourself, journaling, or talking to family members, talking to close friends. Secondly, keeping a list of your activities and just seeing, okay, trust yourself. What do I like? What do I not like? Thirdly is actually taking personality tests. You and I are very interested in that, I think. And um, I think they get a lot of flag. A lot of people are like, oh, it's not really scientific. It's not because it can change over time, blah, 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 blah. It's a useful tool, period. You don't have to. It's not gospel. It's not, this is who you are. This is how you always have been and always will be. And I also think that results can be skewed and change over time as you develop more self-awareness because I think when you're taking the test, you still have the whole influence of how people treat you, what they say about you. And there's a question, oh, how, like, do you like to plan ahead or do you like to just go with the flow? And you like disagree or agree on a spectrum, right? And you're like, oh, well, I kind of, I don't know. I kind of don't like to do that, but I know it's good. I know it's important for me to do. So I let me say yes. It's like, okay, so who told you that it's important to do that, right? And so I think people can get skewed results. I've gotten mixed results over time, but as I've developed more self-awareness, as I've learned more about myself and learned to trust myself better, I think my results have gotten more accurate. So let's go through a list. I think we can also compile a list and then people can get access to it and look at it somewhere else. So they don't have to take notes here, but um, Myers Briggs is an obvious one. Sixteen Personalities dot com. Um, I think we're both ENTJs. Extroverted, depends on, intuitive, thinking, and judging. I would say so. Depends on the seasons. Like, like you said, sometimes it does. I have scored. I think uh, INSJ at times. Like. It, but it depends how, what am I going through? What <laughs> I remember uh, at the, the point before I sold my business, I was in the whole mode of systematizing the whole thing. And I did a personality test then and it showed um, ESTJ, which is crazy. And so I think also taking in uh, the IFS internal family systems framework, which I talked about in an old video, I think it'd be an interesting topic to touch on, but it's the idea that we have multiple parts inside of us. So it's almost like having multiple personalities. Like when you're talking to your mom, you're a different person than when you talk to your teacher, than when you talk to your boyfriend or girlfriend. And so we have different personalities that come out at different points. For example, when we're, when we're in a fight or in an argument, maybe a different part of us comes out. And so it could be five parts, could be 10 parts. And so I think these also have different modes of operating. And that brings in a whole thing, but I don't want to overcomplicate it, right? It's it's like these these are useful tools and they can give you some insight. Next up would be the the DISC personality test, which basically tests four types: dominance. Uh, uh, I forgot what it is, but I think another framework to use um, DISC is what it's called. DISC is basically categorizing people into four buckets, which is promoters, supporters, analyzers, and controllers. So we tend to fall heavily on one and then lean on one of the adjacent ones, typically. Um, I And it also depends, again, on the situation you're in, but that's that was a really useful one for me to take because 
Again, these tests, they tell you here may be some of your strengths, here may be some of your weaknesses, here may be something for you to look at and work on, right? Um, another one is Colby, K-O-L-B-E, which analyzes your working styles. So there's Fact Finder, there's four types, Fact Finder, Quick Start, um, and then two others. So just how you like to operate. Um, do you like to, before you do something, do you like to just do a bunch of research and get really heavily into the topic before you take action steps? Or are you just a quick start and you're like, let me just innovate, let me just do that. And so I, for example, I'm very high quick start. I like to just start new things and just let me just innovate. Let me just do something new. I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. I don't want to stabilize things. I'm here to mess things up. I'm here to stir things up. And I mean, looking at my YouTube stuff and all that, I, I always try to bring something new to the table and that's sometimes difficult for my team because they're like, I thought we we're doing this. And I'm like, no, we have to do this now. And I need someone who stabilizes me, someone who's higher in in another bucket, right? Um, who's higher in like stabilizing or whatever the other ones are. Then there's the Enneagram. Have you heard of that one? Have you done that one? I have. I didn't really dive too deep. I think I'm like a 3W2, something like that. I think I am too. I think I'm the achiever adjacent to some sort of supporter type of thing. Um, then there's the 12 types.com by Ty Lopez. Think of him what you want. I think the tests are really good. There's four motivations. What are the four things that motivate you most? Looking at different hormones. So are you more motivated by status? Are you more motivated by money, by freedom, or by mastery? Things like that, right? Maybe I got those wrong. Also, ideal career. You can do a test there. And then also worldview. I haven't done this one yet. Um, and then Jordan Peterson also has some interesting ones. I think all of these, you can't go wrong. The more you know yourself, the better your life gets. The more you accept who you are at your core and work with that, the better your life gets. Also notice when you take a test and you don't like the results. You're like, oh no, I'm not the Elon Musk type. Damn it. Because again, that's, that goes to like shame and should and like not embracing who you are. I think it's very common. You see a test and you're like, but I want it to be that one because I look up to this person and I want to be like them. <sighs> Accept it. Like every personality type is great. We need all of them. They all have their use cases. They all have their quirks and beautiful pieces and parts to it. And they all have their weaknesses. So... Yeah. And there's a reason why they exist. We need all of them. And just to end on the whole idea of not embracing who you are, this is one of the top five regrets of the dying. It's, you know, when they asked elderly people in an elderly home, what are the top five regrets that you have? One of the top fives, one of the most common ones is, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. And if you feel shame around the results you get, or who you are, who you'd like to be. Like how much longer do you want to live that way? Because you will regret this. Play with them, work with them. And I think from there, it's just about trying stuff out. Like try it out, mess things up. Like things that maybe normally you wouldn't have tried. Because I think outside of the edges of where you're comfortable, that's where you see where the actual edge is, right? Where you go over the edge and you're like, this is definitely not for me. And really just trying it out. Like it doesn't take much to just do an internship. Ask someone, hey, can I... Can I help you with this one project? Like it's just reaching out and you can you can test it really quickly instead of like going to study for something for three years and then realizing, oh, oopsie, I actually don't like it. Like just, you know, intern for someone. The big part, the deep stuff is like the purpose, right? Like how do you figure out what what, what is your life purpose? What is your big why? And I think, I don't know what the process is for me. I developed or figured out my purpose when I went to Date With Destiny, Tony Robbins event. And... Yeah, for me, it's just, I want to make people feel alive. And I also want to bring people together and just bring joy and, and, and love and connection to people. And I think that in itself is what I strive to do with this podcast. This is what drives me in taking risks, whether it's in a friendship, in a, in a romance, in, in business. And it's something that drives me that's beyond the needs that I want to meet for myself. So it's almost like a spiritual component to, to, you know, you have the tangible, okay, I want to make this much money. And I, yeah, I would just ask yourself, what do you, what do you feel deeply passionate about? 
Like what's something that you cannot accept that you can't stand for? What's a problem that you're like, oh, this is really like, oh, I can't live with this, right? And I think oftentimes our purpose comes from pain from the past. Um, that's something to look at. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way to to word it, to pinpoint it. It's really for yourself. Does it energize you? Does it tickle your pickle? Like I said before, just, you know, pick that for yourself. Keep iterating, keep doing things, keep trying things. And then as you go, you narrow things down. I remember every video I made in the beginning on the channel, I realized I liked this about this video. I didn't enjoy having to script it all. I didn't enjoy having to edit so much. And then the next video, try to make an adjustment. Oh, I want to make it more funny. I want to make it more lighthearted. And then I was like, ah, okay, I like that part, but I think there's something missing here. And so I would just keep narrowing it down where you, I just kept peeling back the layers of the onion. And I think that's really what it comes down to. This is a process that is going to continue in your life. And as you get older, as you get more experience, as you keep reflecting and iterating, you get closer and closer to what you love. Yeah, and I would add... Wonderfully said, by the way, Jimmy, that your preferences aren't as random as you think. Those uh, flashes of genius, of insight, whatever you call it, we tend to ignore that inner voice uh, and listen to everybody else's voice, our teachers, our friends, our families. But you, you, you like certain things done certain ways. And when you like something, when you get that insight that other people don't around you, I think it's often because unconsciously you, it's more important to you than they realize. Like they don't realize how important this thing is. And that's where like the, the greats come out of, right? You, they chase something that the other people around them don't mess with. It's, but it's, it's so important to them. Like they, they geek out over it. They almost become like a little bit obsessed and everybody's, ah, you know, they, they laugh at, at you in the beginning and then they're, ah, you know, they were, they were a genius. They, they saw, they saw ahead, but those people just followed, they trusted thyself. <laughs> like that's all that's, and that's, uh, uh, w the whole process of everything that we've talked about on, on this pod is like especially with the purpose with that with that third part right to just go f like you get an idea you get an insight sometimes it's best to act right away and again on the superpower i think uh even if you already found your passion the superpower i think once you develop that and you get really clear on that what's the one thing that man when 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 you know time is about to run out and you have the last second in the basketball match whatever i don't know much about basketball so i'm just Tell me if I'm messing up this analogy, but you have the last seconds left. What's the thing that people say, okay, throw the ball to Matt, throw the ball to Leon. He's going to, he's going to bring it home. Like, what's that task that people will lean on you for that, you know, that comes so natural to you that you're so good at that people are like, how does he do that? How can she just flip it on like that and boom, she just crushes it. Or like, what is that thing? Because oftentimes we think again, this comes, in, this, this is easy for everyone, but other people go, I would have to work so hard to, to be this naturally good at it. And then when you go and develop that strength, you just like, you're just crushing it. And I think people who figure that out very soon what is their one thing and they dive into that they're the ones who are complete outliers in their performance the more time you can spend on that unique superpower the better your output will be and the more fulfilled you'll be because it's easy for you and so um, that's another thing to figure out i think at any stage whether you're already in a business or in a career or a job that you love getting closer to figuring that out that's money and it's counterintuitive to, uh, it, it is because when you say this, you know what, uh, there's like little Maddie, my inner voice starts to talk and it's like, well, how are you going to make money from it? You know, it's like, there's that, like, 
it's it, that's the challenge because people have to pay for their they have they have obligations and I could I could just hear myself okay find my power how am I gonna make money and what I think is if you if you obsess over the the, the thing and and naturally you're gonna get better at it you'll figure out these little how to build a funnel who do I need to talk to like if you want to monetize it not that you have to it's like, but I, I sense that it uh, coming up like, this yeah. won't make money. And it's just really sitting with that. It's, okay, I don't know a way to make money with that yet, but I know I'm really good at this. So let me just keep that in the back of my mind and then opportunities show up. And then later on, you connect the dots looking back and you're like, oh, how could I not see that? Well, I just didn't know. So um, that's the main topic. So the plan for the podcast is we're going to have a main topic like, just then, ideally, it's not going to be an hour or an hour and a half, however long this ends up being in the podcast now. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, we talk about some of the topics too. There's some things that recently happened. So last week, published the interview with Sam Ovens. That seems to be well-received. It was really cool talking to him because he was someone that I really looked up to um, while I was going through a period of experimentation. And it's just cool meeting someone like him in real life. Uh, same thing with Hamozi. Right, like um, had the pleasure of having him on my channel in 2021, 2022, and then recently meeting him in real life for the first time. So um, I went to Vegas to visit Matt. He lives in Las Vegas. I live in Austin. And the school games happened. They happen once a month. It's basically the winners of a competition. The school games is a competition. And the winners who, the 10 people who make the most money on school that month, they get flown out to Las Vegas to attend a mastermind. And I happen to be there as a plus one, as an imposter, as someone who shouldn't be there because I didn't win, but I knew someone who worked with school, who attended there. And so I snuck in like a typical YouTuber. We went to the acquisitions.com headquarters. Really cool seeing that and seeing the environment. And um, there was Homozi and Sam Ovens and... It was really interesting, the things that Homozi shared on how to monetize, how to monetize a school group, um, just in general, sales wisdom. It was funny. I was sitting very quietly in the corner because I was like, I'm not one of the winners. I didn't work hard to be here. I just I just walked in. I just walked in. I was sitting there, and then in the later afternoon, Homozi was answering a question. He was like sitting in front of everyone. We were sitting in a circle around him with tables, right? And I was shoving a protein bar into my mouth because... No surprise, there's unlimited protein bars, different protein snacks at the acquisitions.com headquarters, different drinks, energy drinks, protein drinks. So, um, of course, right, they have an unlimited supply. That's one of the, one of the um, benefits you get when you work for acquisitions.com, right? And I was in the middle of shoving this, this weird, gooey protein bar into my mouth, and I was trying not to make noise with the packaging. And I mostly just finished answering a question. And I didn't know if he if he remembered me, right? Because he was just he's been on so many podcasts, so many channels. And you know, he was on my channel years ago. And so he finishes answering the question. I have the protein mouth protein mouth, right? With the gooey protein bar. And he looks around, he looks at me, and he goes, Leon, you haven't asked a single question. Is that because you know everything? And I'm just like, with a full mouth, I'm like, oh God, you just put me on the spot. First of all, cool, he remembered me. Awesome. Um, and I was like, um, swallowing, right? And just like, oh yeah, I was uh, wondering. Uh, and then I just like, on the spot, I made up a question. Just like, I've just been wondering about this stuff. And it happened <laughs> to be a good question because I just asked him like, yeah, how would, how would, um, how would someone, how would someone, put together a cool school community um, if they're just a creator, if they're not selling a course, if they're not doing coaching, which is what we don't do, right? I don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. Um, no guru shit. No guru shit. And a lot of that is on school right now. There's a lot of people who monetize through a transformation, right? They have a hundred bucks a month. And what you're going to learn in the school community is you're going to learn how to transform your body, how to finally get a girlfriend, how to stop jerking off, whatever. It could be a lot of things, right? How to make money through sperm donations, <laughs> like whatever, right? <laughs> it could be anything. Yeah, and nothing against that, right? I'm, I'm all for courses and taking trainings. I've spent so much money on that. I'm so glad I did it. And I highly recommend for people who are great at learning and 
are able to discern information well, go and invest into learning skills and, and pay for that, right? And that's coming from someone, again, who doesn't have incentive to tell you that because I'm not selling anything like that. But I asked him, what would that look like as a creator? And it really shifted my mind on community because he's like, yeah, I mean, he was familiar with my channel, which was cool to see. Like, yeah, I mean, your channel is all about just like trying stuff out, right? And so, yeah, you should just host a giant party. Just make it fun. Like, it doesn't have to be a thing where you monetize through teaching something or are uh, you you're gonna learn the five things and look before joining this community johnny had made five thousand dollars a month and now he makes ten thousand no none of this you don't have to do any of that and i was like oh, cool it, it'd be the opposite in your community johnny was making five thousand dollars a month now he's at tw tw 2500 exactly. after joining <laughs> yes but <laughs> but the benefit you get is you had a lot of fun you had fun you you met some people, you had a good time, right? And I think that's the benefit I want to bring, right? That we want to bring. So we are planning on starting a school community and also um, using it like a Patreon, right? So very low ticket. It's just like a dollar a month, $3 a month, $5, whatever, right? We're probably going to start very low, move it up to 3 or $5 at some point. Yeah, just people can connect. They can support us if they want to. They maybe can get some some bonus stuff, whatever. But that's that was really interesting to see going to that um, going to that conference, and we'll see we'll see how what we put together, right? We have some plans here and there, but um, yeah, that was an interesting trip. And it's always cool meeting people in real life that you've seen on screen a lot, and you have an idea of what they're like, but you're not sure. And time and time again, I just see that Sam Ovens is exactly the way that he is in his videos. Um, or in the interviews that I've seen, right? Um, and then also seeing him in an environment where he's just fun and goofing around. Like he's actually really funny and he loves goofing around. Hamozi, same same person. Like just massive dude, 235 pounds, lean. Um, and just easygoing, nice. Like um, very, very cool. Very cool to meet them. I think that's uh, when people say... Um be authentic and especially when it, it caters to creators that would and when someone's inauthentic it you could just kind of sense that they're not really the person they are on camera in real life there's a larger disconnect and it's cool to hear that you know Hermosi really does live and breathe all the business stuff and same thing on, on Sam's side like they're very close to what they put out there so it doesn't sound like you were surprised by anything. Eh? It just felt like um, watching a video, but he's sitting in front of me. And then I tried to like <laughs> speed it up a little bit and it didn't work. And then I tried to pause and it's like, oh, wait, no, yeah, I can't. <laughs> I'm just like touching his nose, just like, wait, wait, say that again. <laughs> I did also ask Homozi, hey, um, just wanted just asking for a friend. Uh, do I know you shifted to just making business content and stuff like that. Do you still do podcasts? Just, I'm just curious. And he said, uh, no, I'm not going on other people's podcasts anymore. Uh, so he's now focused on only uploading on his own channels, only talking business, because that's just what they've seen makes more sense. Like for him to go on Chris Williamson's podcast or Diary or CEO or whatever, maybe a driven podcast, um, doesn't make sense for him time-wise. We, we can maybe try threatening violence or something. We, we just have to figure out a way. But yeah, we, we can get crafty with that. But uh, looks like, yeah, he's not going to come on anytime soon. But uh, yeah, that was the experience meeting Homozi and Sam Ovens in real life. That was a cool moment. Um, like it's usually moments like this when I feel really alive. Because Sam Ovens was somebody I looked up to so much and now I look down on him. I'm kidding. <laughs> No, I looked up to him so much and um, I learned so much from him and then just hanging out with him. I mean, we had a meeting with him too. We flew to LA to talk about some s ideas that we had for school and we just flew to LA from Las Vegas because it's like a 45 minute flight. Yeah, hung out with him at the office. So could have recorded a podcast there too, but we were there for something else and uh, it was just cool hanging out with him and chatting with him five years ago. 
I was a fanboy, right? And so now it's it's just cool to be around these people. Also, another idea for this podcast is to have different segments. And I'm curious to hear from you guys what you think in the comments, dear listeners, what you actually like. Because um, I want to keep this lighthearted, fun, playful, and have different things. Like, for example, this episode, we had a main topic. Then, okay, what happened recently? Let us know what you think of this episode. Give us feedback. Did you learn something? If so, what? Engage in the comments. Leave us a review on Spotify if you're listening there. And see you in the next one. Stay driven. Peace.